Imagine a woman giving birth. Enduring, she finds herself abruptly flying over the hospital and into a deep, empty space. A group of circular entities inform her she never existed, that she had only merely been allowed to imagine her life, but it was all a joke. She was not real. She argued facts about her life and description of Earth, but no, they said, none of that had ever been real. And this is all there is, this big, empty void. Welcome back, you guys, to another episode of Bright Lights Beyond. So this is episode five, and much like last week, it is going to be a solo episode. So if you guys like hearing my voice, then you guys are in for a big treat because it is all me this episode. Now, this episode, I want to preface, is not for the faint of heart. I kind of want to talk about the not-so-positive side of near-death experiences. We get into a little bit of some difficult topics to talk about. I do think it is important that we talk about this because I don't want to alienate or mitigate people who have had near-death experiences that weren't so positive, but it is a little bit harder and definitely, like I said, not for the faint of heart. Um, Viewer discretion is advised. So with that in mind, let's get right into it. In the near-death experience community, it's called distressing near-death experiences. So a normal near-death experience um, has a very positive spin, and you see a prominent figure or your family members, and you're in a white light, and it's serene, and, you know, the trees are beautiful, and you feel like you're in, you know, the Garden of Eden, and, you know, the not-so-positive side, the, the negative near-death experiences where you're kind of like in a void or you know even worse like hell when I was doing research about distressing near-death experiences I actually came across one in pop culture now if you've ever seen the HBO show The Sopranos you might know what I'm talking about and if you haven't watched that show, you need to stop what you're doing, whether it's driving a car, filling out job applications, or even feeding your baby. Stop what you're doing and watch this show because it's so good. And I don't want to get into the whole like semantics of the show right now. But anyway, great show if you haven't seen it. But I'm going to take you back to season two, episode nine. It's called From Where to Eternity. So even if you haven't watched the show, this would be super great to watch for the first time just to like recount this distressing near-death experience. So one of the characters, Christopher, um, Christopher Maltesanti, actually, he was in the ICU and he was having some kind of surgery and he actually like died on the table. And so the family and everybody who loves him, including Tony Soprano and Tony Soprano's wife, Carmela, Um, are in the waiting room and they're all waiting to hear what's going to happen to him. And while they're waiting, Carmela actually goes into a room and and prays to God. And she basically says, like, listen, I know what my family does. I've accepted that. And I just want you to have mercy on us. Like if Christopher comes through and he doesn't die, like he'll turn back to God and, and, you know, I'll pray every night and all these different things. She's bargaining with God, basically. Well, Christopher ends up making it and so he comes out of surgery and tony and one of the other characters polly goes in there to visit him and he's on morphine obviously and he's all laid up but they go in and they're like christopher you made it they're like christopher Uh but anyway they're like christopher you made it like everything's gonna be okay and he's like oh no not everything's gonna be okay and they're like what are you talking about and he's like i went to hell and they're like no you didn't christopher like stop he's like no i saw my dad and my dad was in hell and we're all going to hell And so he basically sits there and he kind of recounts what his hell is. And he's like talking about people he's killed. He's talking about people that the crime family has killed. He's like, no, they're there and we're all going to hell, basically. And so Tony's like, oh, that's like nothing, whatever. And then Polly gets freaked out and like goes on this, you know, it's a whole episode, right? But one of the things that stuck with me is Carmela comes in the next day and sits on his bed. And Tony had told Carmela, because Carmela is like a very religious Catholic person, and Tony had told Carmela, like, you know, your prayers help save him. Like, when he crossed over, he saw God, like, you know, whatever. And she's like, oh, my God, like, it was my prayers. I saved him, whatever. You know, it's a whole it's a whole episode arc, so you really need to watch it. I'm just trying to give you the cliff notes. And I could talk about The Sopranos for hours, so this might be like a seven-minute, this might be a seven-minute segment. But basically, 
basically, Carmela goes in the next day to talk to Christopher. And she sits on the edge of his bed and she's like, hey, like, Tony told me that you crossed over and you saw God and your dad was there and, and you know, you saw Jesus, you know, and like, I'm so happy that you saw him, whatever. And Christopher's sitting in the bed and he's like, uh, I went to hell. And she's like, no, Tony told me that you went to heaven. And he's like, no, Carmela, I went to hell. And she's like, oh, my God. And so she takes it as a moment to tell him, like, maybe you need to repent and go back to the Lord. Like, I saved you. And even though you saw hell, that doesn't mean that you're eternally damned that, you know, you you can start turning your life around. But, yeah, I remembered that when I was looking at these and I was like, wow, you know, like, it's pretty rare to have a near-death experience that is not positive, but it does happen. And there are depictions of it in um, pop culture, you know. But I suggest watching that episode. It's it's just, first of all, a good series. And second of all, it kind of gives you a little bit of like, wow, um, you know, near-death experiences aren't always positive. And it also gives you a pretty funny description about like what Christopher Maltesanti's freaking hell looks like. And apparently it's in an Irish pub. So let's start looking at actual real people's distressing near-death experiences. I think it would be beneficial for us to define kind of what a distressing near-death experience is. And for that, I'm going to go to my handy-dandy Dr. Bruce Grayson because he is always out here on the front lines telling us what is up. So in a research article by Nancy Evans Bush and Dr. Bruce Grayson called Distressing Near-Death Experience, The Basics, they define distressing near-death experiences in three categories. The inverse near-death experience, the void near-death experience, and the hellish near-death experience. So these are the three types of distressing near-death experience most patients or people will encounter. Now, people who experience inverse near-death experiences, um, so unlike the usually reported near-death experiences that are pleasurable, they're perceived as hostile and threatening. Then you have void near-death experience. A near-death experience of the void is an ontological encounter with a perceived vast emptiness, often a devastating scenario of aloneness, isolation, and sometimes annihilation. So this is actually closely related to the near-death experience that I mentioned at the top of the show. She had had a void near-death experience where it's like they were like, you're not real, girl. This is the end. Like, you were never real. Like, it's a void of your life. It's a void of everything. And the last near-death experience that is distressing is the hellish near-death experience. So that is a overly hellish experience. It's the least common type of distressing near-death experience. And it is what you think of like fire and brimstone and lakes of, you know, lava and like flames and it smells like sulfur. That is the hellish near-death experience. Now, these three types of near-death experiences are traumatic, and it is so rare. Um, These near-death experiences normally kind of have people grappling with the worldly reality, and it kind of ruptures their sense of life, and it leaves them with a lot of questions. Now, the three common approaches to these different near-death experiences, these these distressing near-death experiences, is a turnaround, a reduction, and the long haul. To grapple with these types of near-death experiences, people have come up with scenarios and reasons why and what they're experiencing. So the turnaround. So that means I needed that. So a lot of people who experience these distressing near-death experiences maybe are not the most trustworthy people or maybe they're criminals. Some could be violent or, you know, maybe not living their life in a way that they really need to or should be. Um, And they have a turnaround moment, almost like an aha moment. Like I needed to go through this. I needed to like feel like I wasn't a person. I needed to kind of like have this like, you know, emptiness and loneliness feeling for me to realize that life is more than just about myself. And so that's one reason, a turnaround, you know, like a lot of people who experience distressing near-death experience actually like become like evangelicals, like straight up, you know, do a 180 from the life that they lived previously, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, you know? There's actually a near-death experience that I looked into. It was a distressing one um, from a man named Ronnie Reagan. And Ronnie Reagan, he had a very hard growing up. He was abused as a kid by his dad, was an alcoholic, very abusive. He ends up, you know, living 
by himself at 12 years old. He decides to, like, basically leave his home and go live in the woods. He ends up in jail a couple times. He gets married, has some kids. He, in turn, abuses them, you know, very physically abusive and, like, would punch walls and, and be disrespectful to his wife and all these different things. And so he had a very rough growing up and then, in turn, kind of flipped it and did the same to his family. And at 25, he was walking down the street with his son and this guy said something to him and they start to get into this big altercation and this guy that ronnie's fighting ends up slicing his like bicep muscle or something crazy and blood goes everywhere he passes out a random passerby on the street helps him to a car and they drive to a hospital the hospital is like we can't help you like you're gonna die but one of the nurses were like no let's try to transport him to another hospital so they transport him to another hospital when he, he was in the ambulance he has a near-death experience from the blood loss so he's in this ambulance and all of a sudden he's in hell he says the ambulance like explodes and he's just in hell and he knows it's hell because there's like a lake of fire where people that he had met in prison or his friends that had passed in violent or dangerous ways they were in that river and it was like a river on fire but they weren't being consumed he said that it was so scary down there it smelled like something he'd never smelled in his life he was like electrical fire smell but then also sulfur and all he could hear were the people in the lake that he had known. These are people that he said that he knew that were in this like lake of fire, this river of fire. And they were screaming and saying, Ronnie, don't do it. Like, you need to go back. Like, get out of here. You can't stay here. And he said that as soon as he saw that these were people he knew and he was like, can I help you guys? They were like, Ronnie, get out of here. Like, leave, whatever. And so he ends up, you know, I guess coming back through the light and he's back in a hospital room and they were able to save his arm they didn't have to amputate it and he remembers his wife standing over him and he said that, that was what kind of changed his life she had just become a born-again christian and she took him to a service and within the first like 10 minutes of the service he felt like he had found a new purpose and he actually rebuked his life of like i guess sin or like violent crimes because it's not just sin it's like he went to jail several times and was like an alcoholic and a drug user um, and he became a pastor and now is a pastor of like a church. And it, it's through that distressing near death experience that changed him so much that he switched up his entire lifestyle to become a pastor and to save other people because he felt like he was saved. And that's kind of on brand with, you know, regular near death experiences where you are, you know, saved. And, and so you transform your life. So, so it makes sense, but but yeah, very scary. And like, you know, reading about his story and listening to him tell it in his own words was just, you know, truthfully haunting almost. It makes me kind of scared. You know, I, I'm going to be alone tonight and I'm like, I'm kind of scared to go to bed. I'll manage. But, you know, it, it's true that that definitely did happen to him and he switched up his whole life. So so that's part of the turnaround. Another way of grappling with this distressing NDE is through reductionism. And that means it was only a blank. So like it was only a chemical reaction or if it was only because I watched this movie that I saw what I saw or it was only because of this. So this reductionism is described as the greatest defense that they have to why this happens to them as many people know there's not necessarily a rhyme or reason why any of these near-death experiences happen to these people other than maybe they need to hear it or you know you, you know like maybe the universe needed them to hear it but there's not necessarily like concrete evidence why jim bob whatever had a near-death experience so that's what reductionism kind of does. It's like there's not really a rhyme or reason, but if there is, it's because of science. So so I can understand why that would be a major component to these distressing ones because you can't grapple with like why this happened. And the last one is the long haul. And the long haul is what did I do to have this near-death experience? Unlike other experiences, like this is the difficult part and they can't understand why this terrifying NDE happens to them which is understandable. If I had a near-death experience and I didn't get to go to the bright white light and to feel amazing and to see relatives in heaven or in the great beyond, and I went to like a hell or a void, I'd have some questions too. I'd be like, um, what did I do to get here? So the long haul is basically like the never ending question. Like, what did I do to deserve this? And there isn't an answer that's just like, 
what? And so the long haul actually can end up consuming people because they will kind of like over in their head, like, why did I have to go here? Like, what happened? Like, what did I do? And so so it's kind of hard. And in a lot of times, it's like, why me? And that can really destroy people. But the silver lining is, you know, everyone knows how diamonds are made through pressure. And so a lot of people who experience these distressing near-death experiences go through a tremendous, you know, sadness and loss and scary place. But from that, they can become a better person. Through this adversity, they're able to sometimes, you know, live different lives or get meaning out of it, even if it's scary and hard and sometimes like unexplainable. People are resilient and so distressing near-death experiences has really taught these people that like no matter what adversity you may face there is something else out there and what you saw or what you feel right now doesn't have to be your eternity the best definition or explanation people who have had distressing near-death experiences can gain is there's a balance so kind of like in you know eastern philosophies it's suffering death and rebirth and it's a balance of it all not all the time can it be happy you can't always be in love sometimes you have to face heartbreak that's just a part of being human so a lot of times these near-death experiences that are negative can reset you and give you a new life or rebirth it's a balance you know a lot of times westerners or you know the western thinking of hell is kind of like what that is but that's not necessarily like truthfully what this means and nobody really knows what it means these are all speculations just like in regular near-death experiences but the best that they can give us is the cycle the suffering the death and then the rebirth and life and joy again so that's kind of like what the biggest takeaway from these near-death experiences are now i know this episode was a little hard to listen to and i went on a bit of a tangent with the sopranos sue me but you know this is also a side that people have done research albeit not as much research but the reason why people even look into this and why dr grayson and dr evans looked into this and wrote this is for people in the medical field to be able to deal with those who have had distressing near death experiences now a lot of the stories i looked at with these distressing near death experiences people had to seek counseling or you know talk to the therapist or doctor about what they saw and that's understandable a lot of times these near-death experiences aren't reported because of how scary it was or, or how much they don't want to talk about it or relive it or tell anybody that happened to them. But my advice is even if you've had this near-death experience, it doesn't mean that you're a bad person. It doesn't mean that you need to change your life completely. It could be simply a reminder of the balance of life and that you shouldn't be afraid to share these stories because this is also part of life, suffering and, and you know, being scared and, and whatnot. So as hard as it is to hear some of these stories and to think about that, you know, it, it really is just a part of life. Um, and I'm grateful that We have research on it, and I'm grateful that people are learning how to deal with people who have had these traumatic experiences because there's nothing worse than having this experience and then not having anybody to talk to about it. Like I said, this episode was a little, you know, harder and and the Sopranos talk, you know, I I kind of went off there for a minute, but but I hope that you guys still found this enjoyable. And and I also hope that you can realize that in your own life, there's a balance. Um, You know, being a human is suffering. Being a human is dying. Being a human is giving birth, you know, and then rebirth. So so it's all it's all in a cycle. But um, next week will be our last episode um, for this season, at least. Um, and I'm going to be joined with Marina and I'm so excited. A- and I just want to say thank you again so much for supporting us and listening to us. And please follow us on Instagram. Please follow us on Facebook. Please engage with us on our website and please, please, please share. And also, you know, just keep listening. It's the consistency for me, you guys. Anyway, I love y'all. And just remember to live life beyond. <laughs>